City of Faith International. Welcome to Sunday morning service here on Facebook Live. Glad to see everyone. Pray that you've had a wonderful day so far. But I would just like to thank you again for joining us this morning. Here at Seed of Faith International, we provide plain instructions for victorious living. Our pastor is Dr. Herman Scales. Our first lady is Dr. Myra Scales. We are located in Raytown, Missouri at 9301 East 87th Street. Our website is www.sofintl.org. We meet here on Facebook Live every Sunday morning at 11.30 a.m. and on Wednesdays for our Bible study at 7 o'clock p.m. here on Facebook Live. You can also join us for any of our services by phone. The phone-in number is 563-999-2633. Also, we have prayer, and it's only by phone, and you can call in that same number, 563-999-2633, for prayer on Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m., and again on Tuesday evenings at 7 o'clock p.m. All those times are Central Standard Time. Tonight, we're excited. We're going to have our first Park and Praise drive-up service at 6 p.m. at our Raytown campus. If you have an RSVP, please do so. Um, so we look forward to seeing everyone out for the first time since our COVID experience. <laughs> so let's get into the word. Uh, amen. So let's grab our Bible here and see the faith. We like to make a confession over our uh, word. So this morning, as you get your Bible, and we're going to make our faith confession. So repeat after me. This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am what it says that I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the uncompromised word of God. I boldly confess I am a doer, not just a hearer. I am above and not below, not beneath. I am the head and not the tail. I am the lender and not the borrower. I am the victor and not the victim. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And there is absolutely nothing the devil can do about it. Now shout hallelujah, amen. So that's our faith confession. And we say that not just out of habit of doing it, but we say it because we believe it. We boldly confess because not so uh, God can hear because he can hear our thoughts even. But we want the enemy to know that this is what we believe and we are declaring it over ourselves. Amen. So if you was with me on Wednesday night, we talked about what you will to do you will do. So this is a continuation of that. If you haven't heard it, uh, I would recommend that you go back and listen to it and it may put some pieces together that you may be missing, but uh, we're going to continue on. And I pray that God will just uh, open up your spiritual ears and illuminate this word. So it gets right to where you need it to be. Amen. He has a way of doing that. He gives us all the message that we need to have no matter what all the messages everyone else needs to have, but he has a way of translating the Holy Spirit, puts that into your spirit that you can get out of it what it's intended to get out of it, amen? Because he said his word will not return to him void, but it will accomplish everything that is set out to do, amen? So that was kind of an appetizer from last week. You will do what you will to do. So we're going to talk about today, setting your will in motion. You see, setting your will is not something that you should take lightly because we always do what we will to do. And sometimes we do it um, unintentionally. We do it uh, just by rote, just by this is what I feel like doing. However, I want you to think about your will is really a soulish undertaking. See, you are a three-part being. You are a 
spirit, a walking, talking spirit that lives in a body which possesses a soul. Now, the soul is also multifaceted, three components. It consists of your mind, your will, and your emotions. So to set your will affects both your mind and your emotions because it's all in the soul. That's why the scripture tells us clearly that we must renew our minds. Why? Because it will affect our will and our emotion. It all starts with what you're thinking. It gets in your mind, what you focus on, what you meditate on, what you reason with, what you experience, and eventually you develop an appetite for it. When that appetite becomes overwhelming, you begin to set your wheels towards that thing. That then affects your emotions toward it. You're happy when you have it. You're sad when you don't. You're passionate about obtaining it. And then when you don't like it, you want to destroy it. Your mind, will, and emotions is your soul. And so we need to look at how can we set our will in order to have the desired results, which is to please God. You can set your will toward what is good what is indifferent or what is evil. But we as people of God, we need to have the desire to set our will towards what is pleasing to God. But it's only fair to see what happens when sometimes we don't set our will towards what's pleasing to God because we have a body that needs what it needs, it's been seen some things, it's heard some things, it's tasted some things, it's been some places, and now that seed has been planted in our mind, in our, in our body, in our mind, and we start thinking about it, focusing on it, dreaming about it, trying to fulfill that need so we can satisfy what the body wants because our mind has fed into it some information that now our emotions have gotten involved and now our will is set to satisfy the flesh. So what does that look like when you do some of those things, when you set your will towards something that may not be pleasing to our Lord and Savior? So my first example, I pray that I get through these examples so that you can see the whole gamut of what setting your will looks like. My first example is a story that we've all probably heard uh, at some point in time, but I just want to look at it a little bit different this morning. So if you would go with me to 2 Samuel, you know the story of David, but let's look at this, breaking it down. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabah. But David remained at Jerusalem. That, that was interesting. I read that differently to the, uh, while I was studying for this lesson. In the spring, all the kings go out to battle. However, David sent his, key, his troops and he stayed at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. Now, see, David was king. He already had, I believe, eight wives. Surely they had to be beautiful. I mean, he had, he had the pick of the litter, right? That's not to downplay the beauty of a woman, but he had his choice, whatever he wanted. He had eight beautiful wives, let's say. Yet David did not just notice that a woman was bathing. He actually lingered there to gaze upon her beautiful body. See, a glance is not going to tell you how beautiful something is. You got to do more than just glance. You just don't walk back. You take a second look and a third look. And then you just sit there and like stare or whatever. 
a glance, an instant glance, and that's why I surmised David did more than just glance. So he took a much longer look to identify how beautiful this woman was. See, this is a temptation. We are not condemned by a temptation. Being tempted is not sin. That is not where the sin begins. The sin is in yielding to that temptation. Being tempted just like Jesus. Jesus was tempted, yet he did not sin. So being tempted is part of the human experience. So you will be tempted. However, when David glazed, glanced, checked out, examined this woman bathing, he was putting thoughts into his mind. He imagined this woman being his own. The thought of that beautiful woman actually took root in his mind. That root was so deep, he had to move to action. Two things had happened. David, he's a walking, talking spirit that loves God, right? David loves God. However, he lives in a fleshly body. And his soul's mind had captured just a glimpse of another beautiful woman, just a stone's throw away. See, the mind dwells on that thought and it develops a desire to have that thing that looks pleasing. The emotions begin to align with the mind, to influence the action, to satisfy the lust and the desires of the flesh, which you just fed into. So what happens next? Now, there's really no scripture reference that says that this happened all in one day, or all in three hours or two hours. But I want to think that this didn't just happen in one day, this whole story about David. In my imagination, I believe this was something that was ongoing. David glanced at the woman. He seen that she was beautiful. He started thinking about it. That the nature of mankind, he started playing this movie over and over in his mind, working up his emotions to satisfy the lust of the, fl the lust of the flesh. And he became thinking about that and it became something that he thought about constantly. In 1 John 2 and 1, it says, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the father, but from the world. See, David was dealing with all three of these uh, dynamics. David was a king. He could do whatever he wanted, or he felt like he could do whatever he wanted with whoever he wanted, however he decided to do it. See, that's where pride come in, the pride of life. I'm the king. I can do whatever it is I want to do. Then his body was uh, being succumbed by the lust of the flesh. He desired this woman to be his own. And then because... He saw it. He saw the woman, saw that she was beautiful and it fed into his mind. And so now you got the mind the, and the emotions working to satisfy the thing of the flesh that you have fed into. So now David's will is being strengthened. David now has set his will in motion to obtain that thing which he saw, which he sought after and planted a strong emotion toward obtaining. His will is now equipped to move forward. So what happens in verse three? David. So David sent and inquired about the woman. That tells me he didn't know who she really was. So he sent his people out, go check her out, go find out who she was. And someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? In verse four, David continues to act. Even after receiving the information that would normally be a deterrent, David's will is set. There are no deterrents. What David will to do, he will do. So in verse four, it says, then David sent messengers again, and they took her and she came to him. He lay with her and she was cleansed from her impurity and she returned to her house. 
David was not going to let anything stop him from doing what he had willed to do. I believe this took place over a period of time. It wasn't instant, as I said before. I don't believe this is just a one day, 30 minutes, going to do this. No. And it sounds as though, as I read it, that this was a relationship that began. Because you know the story. At the end of time, at some period of time, you know the story that Sheba gets pregnant. David's like, oh, Lord, what am I going to do with this? I'm going to fix it. Because he has a will to please God, but his will was stronger to desire that woman and satisfy the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And you know the story. He killed her husband. He had her husband killed and he received unintended consequences. But thank God, God loved him so much. He put in place the prophet Nathan. And Nathan came and showed him where he had went wrong. And so David was like, wow, was that me? How did I do such a thing? So he was convicted in his spirit that now his will was so strong to desire this woman that was not his, that was not pleasing to God, that he allowed his will to override his intellect. Will will override your intellect. Will will override anything that makes sense. When you set your will towards something, you're not going to let anything deter that. That's why it's so important to set your will towards what is pleasing to the Lord. So when Nathan exposed David for who he was over in Psalms 51 verses one through four, David was so crushed by knowing what he'd done and how it displeased God. In Psalms 51, one through four, it says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me through from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before you, before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sights so that you may be justified in your words. David was so hurt that he had did what displeased God because he set his will towards pleasing the flesh. That's always going to have unintended consequences. So what does it look like when you set your will towards the plan of God? and even a more for the sake of others. Let's look at another instance in Romans 15, verse one through two. Those of us who are strong and able in the faith need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter and not just do what is convenient for us. Strength is for service, not status. Each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? See, that pleases the Father. There's a scripture that says that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. If we are Jesus' ambassadors in the earth realm, we are his hand and his feet. We are his mouthpiece. We are here to give God glory in every area of our lives. Therefore, we should look towards doing things that are pleasing to God, not just for ourselves, but our fellow man who may be weak, who may need a help, who may need strength, for strength is for service, not status. Amen. So I want to look at a group of friends who set their will to be the answer to someone's prayer. In Luke 5, verse 17 through 20. Let's look at this for a second. On one of the days while Jesus was teaching, some proud religious law keepers and teachers of the law were sitting by him. They had come from every town in the countries of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. The power of the Lord was there to heal them. Some men took a man who was not able to move his body to Jesus. 
he was carried on a bed. They looked for a way to take the man into the house where Jesus was, but they could not find a way to take him in because of so many people. They made a hole in the roof over where Jesus stood. Then they let the bed with the sick man on it down before Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now look at this scenario. Here is a group of friends, not pastors, not elders, not evangelists, not prophets, a group of friends. They had one friend that was impaired, probably been impaired for a long time. So surely they've had a discussion that every time we got to go somewhere, we got to carry Bob. And every time this happened, Bob can't go because of his condition. We need to help Bob. So they bound, got together in unity and thought, started thought, talking. There's a man named Jesus. I know if we can get him there, he would be healed. And let's see what we can do in order to get him there. So I believe they came up with a strategy for some way, somehow, nothing's going to stop us. We are determined to help our friend and there is nothing going to prevent us from getting our friend to Jesus because we know if we get him there, he will be healed. What confidence. They had faith for something that seemed impossible, but yet they were facing a challenge. How are we going to get him there? What's going to happen when we get there? They didn't even, they probably didn't even assess that until they got there. But because their will was so strong, when they got there and they saw that the crowd was too big, they couldn't get through the crowd. They said, we're not going to stop until we get him to Jesus. Determined, strong will, they will get him to Jesus. Then the, the word tell us that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. They weren't passive at all. They diligently sought the master to heal their friend. It also says what you do to the least of these, you do unto me. So in their situation, this man that was lame was considered the weaker of them. He couldn't go and do the things that they could do because of his condition. Nonetheless, they were convinced that if they did all that they could do, they would get him to Jesus and Jesus would heal them, heal the man. So in verse 24, it says, <clears throat> uh, after the leaders and all the rulers was like, oh, who are you that you can forgive sins? You know, so what about this paralyzed man? You know, you're, who are you to heal? You know, because up in the earlier scriptures, it says that, Jesus saw them and said that his sins were forgiven. But in verse 24, it says, but I want you to know that the son of man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been laying on and went home, praising God. Isn't God a, a, a rewarder of those that diligently seek him? In the earlier scripture, it says that Jesus saw the faith of his friends. And he said that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Their will was set. There was nothing going to deter them. They were determined that they were going to get their friend to a man named Jesus. And he would heal him. And immediately he was healed just because of their faith. Amen. They didn't let anything deter them. I would like to share one last example. <clears throat> this is a natural example on how when you set your will, your obstacles will become opportunities. Nothing, no one, no how will stop you from achieving what you will do when you will to do what is pleasing to the Lord. This last example you won't find in any scripture, yet I believe you will find it in the book of life. Now, I have a disclaimer. 
I haven't ha obtained the rights to this story or obtained a, a permission to share it, but I pray that it will be a blessing and enlightening for someone to understand when you set your will to do what is pleasing to God, God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Sometimes I find it easier to seek forgiveness than ask for permission. So I'm asking for forgiveness in advance. So what I want to end with is this example of what setting your will looks like when you will to please God. He will bless the fruit of your labor. In Proverbs 18, verse 22, it reads as this. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So very briefly, I'm going to talk about this last person. It is our own pastor, Dr. Herman Scales. You see, many years ago, I heard pastors say that he told Dr. Meyer that he never wanted to drive in front of their home and hate to come in. So tell me what it is that you need, what is it that you want that will make you happy, and that is what I will do. In that statement, Pastor has said, I will, I'm going to set my will to what is pleasing to my wife. That's scripture, right? Men ought to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Amen. These may not be the exact words he used, but clearly he was demonstrating that he has set his will to be the husband that God has called him to, to be everything that Dr. Meyer desired in a husband. <clears throat> he on purpose has stated how he has set up his life to make it almost impossible to be driven away with fleshly desires. He did this in the beginning, not after he was tempted, but in the beginning, he set his will to make sure he waters Dr. Meyer with words of adoration. Now, Dr. Meyer, she doesn't very often speak publicly. However, she demonstrates also that she has set her will to do the same with the same high standard that their marriage is pleasing to God. Nothing, no one, no thing ever has been granted a permission to cause a wedge between that union. See, together they have come in unity and have set their will to be unified no matter what. This brings me why I want to reiterate to you today. Setting your will is important to pleasing God. Whether it is to be the best husband, the best wife, the teacher, the counselor, whatever the thing is that God has already put inside of you, you know what that thing is. So in order to do this, the scripture warns us to guard our hearts and our minds with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life. When you set your will toward what's pleasing to God, God will reward you with what you need to get it done. Don't allow naysayers, unbelievers, your enemies, or even your friends discount what God has told you that pleases him. They will thwart your ability to accomplish what you want it to do, want it to do. No one can thwart your ability to do what you set your will to do. Because I said last week, what you will to do, you will do. So as Pastor and Dr. Myra, they have set their will together to be husband and wife in unity, serving the kingdom of God. You have an assignment. You know what God has put into your heart. Whether you're that teacher, you be the best teacher. God will bring you resources and give you favor to be that teacher that just pleases him. Every time I leave out, I'm like, Lord, I just want to please you. What is that that makes you smile? Now, you can't earn salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. Salvation is a free gift. 
However, the Lord has put you here to be a blessing to the kingdom of God, to give him glory and honor. He is glorified when he sees a couple representing Christ and the church. He's glorified when children are able to come to school and be taught the word of God by, even if they're not taught by the word, they're taught by the principles of a person that has set their will to look like, sound like Christ in the earth realm. Amen. So you don't have to go in there with the big Bible and a big cross on your neck or anything like that. Just be God's feet, his hands, his mouthpiece to those in your sphere of influence. If you have set your will like David towards something that wasn't pleasing to God, God is not a respecter of person. What he did for David, he definitely will do towards you. He had grace and mercy toward David, and he will also have grace and mercy toward you. Just do as David did in Psalms 51. Come to him, repent, and say, Lord, against you and you only have I sinned. Please forgive me. Blot out my transgressions. Cleanse me from my iniquity. All those things are available to you. You just need to repent, and he'll put you on the right track. Amen? because God desires for you to have a life of abundance. And when we don't set our will intentionally to do what is pleasing to him, we do what is pleasing to the body, give away to the lust of the flesh, whatever's in our mind's eye, and then we end up with unintended consequences as David did. David had unintended consequences. He had a child and that child died because he had set his will to do what was not pleasing to God. Amen. So we want to do like those friends, set our will towards what's pleasing to God. God wanted that man healed and his friends would not allow no to be an answer, would not let the crowd be a deterrent, would not let hard times be a deterrent. What has God placed in your heart that you will to do? Don't let anything be a deterrent. You set your will that this is what I'm going to do because I know this pleases God and I know it'll make him smile when I do whatever this thing is that God has given me to do. I'm going to set my will on purpose to do what is pleasing to God. Amen. Amen. You know, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, we would not want to end this time without giving you the opportunity to do that today. All you have to do is repeat this simple prayer. Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I repent of my sins and I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. He died for my sins and was raised on the third day. I turn from my sins and I invite you to come into my heart and take charge over my life. Thank you for coming into my life. In Jesus name, amen. If you said that short prayer, something amazing happened. You may not see flashing lights or stars roll around your head, but you have now become a part of the family of God. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So now what you need to do to get in a Bible believing, Bible teaching church that you can grow up as spirit man so you can get your mind, will, and emotions in check so you have a will to do what is pleasing to the Lord. And if you've never uh, made that faith confession before, then send us a note, drop us a line. Let us know that you accepted Jesus Christ as your savior today. We will be excited to go on this journey with you and let you know how glad we are to be part of this new relationship. If you're ever in Raytown, come visit us at 9301 East 87th Street in Raytown, Missouri. But in the meantime, see us again on Tuesday night here, on, excuse me, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for our Bible study right here on Facebook Live, or join us next Sunday at 11.30 a.m. 
If um, you want to join us with prayer, we'd love to have you on our prayer line. The phone number is 563-999-2633, and we will be praying with you and for you. Amen. Amen. Have an awesome week until we meet again. God bless you and keep you.